So, we're going to do a panel one back in my day. Then I had to go get some seasoned judges uh, that have been around for a while. Uh, and so I think I did a relatively good job. I have uh, Mr. Hibbs. He's been around since uh, Dark Ages. Zwanger, uh, about half the Dark Ages, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and or, uh, So these judges have been around for a very long time. Now, things as we have them now, how we make rulings, how advancement happens, uh, <laughs> how becoming a judge happens, uh, how the rules apply to players, have changed a lot over the years. And sometimes looking back at how things used to be, uh, it kind of make you go, wow, I'm really happy that doesn't happen anymore. You know, uh, Looking at this uh, can uh, hopefully uh, explain why we do some of the things that we do now. So, anybody have any questions? Max, you were first. It wasn't really directed towards anybody. Directed to everyone. Did the ability substance ever matter? So just to explain to those of you who may not be familiar with this fantastic ability, um, there was a cycle of enchantments in Mirage, in Mirage Block, where the goal was that you could play them as an enchantment normally, or you could flash them in as an instant. And I'm using modern terms when I say things like flash them in. You could flash them in as an instant to give like a surprise benefit. But the already decided it wasn't really balanced if you flashed it in and it stuck around, so they wanted you to get rid of it at the end of the turn. But when they made a new rule set in 1999, the Sixers rules, they didn't really know how to template this. So what they came up with was, um, if you play it as an enchantment, it gains substance. If you play it at instant speed, it does not gain substance. And then at the end of the turn, if it doesn't have substance, you sacrifice it. Uh, since that time, they have figured out how to template it, so they don't need to use like this arbitrary ability that doesn't actually do anything. Uh, and no, I don't think actually it. So, what is a piece of policy that has gone away that would be good if it came back? Who did you direct it to? Everybody. Play space, table, printer. Paper, pen. Most people will get angry if I say uh, it's qualifying all these kinds of things. Oh my! <laughs> DQ! Deck list DQ! My real answer is probably nothing. Sure they have I think policies come a long way. I, 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 I think policies can allow you to. The hardest thing, the one thing that I might consider would be some kind of gray, white area between what to do the mark cards because that would be useful, but it was also really hard to know. like. Uh, Which side do I call it? Mark <laughs> cards minor or major? Um, we still have disagreements in my level three about what to do with those one card that's got a mark on it. Is that a pattern? <laughs> so, uh, what do we do with mark cards? Um, I feel so, still feel like there might be something in there that yeah. um, I was say, put back and past maybe on some things. No, I, I, uh, so add on to his point, judges. it's changed so much that it's gone from being one penalty to two penalties, two to penalties of different names, one is a pattern, one not a pattern. He also use all these different terminologies because they're so, they're so they're sort of locked together uh, and that there's really no good way of doing it. Um, the, and this sort of, uh, one of the things that talking about things that I would, would not want to go back on, you know, it, when I first started judging, really the philosophy of, of penalties were deterrence to, to the severity of the penalty was based on sort of the the amount of potential advantage that a cheater could gain if they were to get away with something, so which is why you would see Steven Zwanger's example of a 59 card deck list being a disqualification because of the advantage, we thought the advantage gained because of that was so great that, that even if the person wasn't doing it on purpose, they still had to be disqualified because of the advantage we gained, and we, we really disassociated those two things. That the advantage, if we think someone could is gaining an advantage from something, we move it into the idea of cheating. And if it's not, then we're not really focused on how much a cheater could get away with it, even if they weren't. So I'm going to stick with uh, the answer of not changing anything. Not, not resurrecting anything. Yeah, I'm not bringing back anything, any of the old, uh, old, uh, old ways. Yeah. <laughs> that answers my question about uh, match point penalties. Like, is that, like, is it useful? <laughs> Match point penalties were for single game matches, such as two-headed giants. Um, and there was a time when people thought that doing competitive two-headed giant was a good idea. Uh, we moved away from that, which is good. Uh, and it was, for those that don't know, that was an idea that 
uh, if, let's say, you had some sort of infraction that would necessitate you getting a game loss. And there was more of those back then. If you look at policy now, it's actually pretty hard to get a game loss uh, in a tournament, but it was a lot easier for some reason, let's say you had registered your deck list wrong and you were going to get a game loss for that, it was only a one game match, then, oh, sorry, you get a game loss, but you only had one game to play, so I guess it's the same as a match loss. And that's a much more severe penalty than we wanted to give out. So they tried to come up with a way to mitigate that kind of in-between thing and sort of an in-game penalty, which is you, could, if you won and you had a match point penalty, you only got two points for a win as opposed to three points. Or in theory, if you lost, negative one point. So how many severe changes to the program that will kill the program have you survived yet? <laughs> all of them. All, all <laughs> many. Like name some of the earlier ones, maybe not all of us know. Uh, the, first, the, first, the first one that, I, that really stands out in my memory was the sixth edition rules changes. Okay. Because that's when they did, did away with uh, interrupts and moved everything to just instance. Um, and they damage on the stack, damage back off the stack. Um, indecisions on that, 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 that was one of the big things. Oh my god, it's going to kill magic. Magic will never recover from these 6th edition rules. First time that was flat out everywhere. Um, and again, part of that too is the internet evolution, right? So, Around 6th edition was the first time they made that kind of sweeping change that it wasn't, we weren't buried off in Usenet someplace where <laughs> only a few people cared. Uh, card sleeves. <laughs> so, when card sleeves first came out, it was just the like, flimsy penny sleeves, they were super controversial. A lot of people complained this was not how magic was designed to be played. There were a lot of people who just refused to play them on principle because this was like coddling people who wanted to keep their cards in good condition. Um, and like the real way to play magic was to like, you know, shuffle your cards as thoroughly and as hard as you could. And if they got a little beat up, well, that was how things were supposed to be. <laughs> Actually, in fact, uh, originally <coughs> opaque sleeves were actually illegal while transparent sleeves were actually legal because people were concerned you couldn't tell whether or not there were actually magic cards in there. <laughs> um, going back to the, actually really right, uh, building off of another thing Hib said about the 6th um, edition rules change, uh, since we all certified right around that time period, or really for around, around, it was in the 90s, it was, you know, it's, it's, yeah. most people in here were alive. Um, <laughs> one of the, talking about it, well, like kill the per, uh, killing magic, it actually did have a, a big impact on the actual judging community. Uh, in fact, the rules, they consider the rules change such, so sort of dramatic that all level threes actually had to go through a recertification process, it's a, re, a retesting, so to speak, and quite a few level three judges that had been around since the beginning, which is, man, Say you know, four or five years, uh, did not choose to, to re up. And that was some of it that the, the program had sort of changed and evolved since they were there. Um, and, but it also was an aspect that showed that the game had changed to a point that some people didn't feel like that was something they wanted to continue doing. Uh, and so, yeah, you know. And at that same time, L2s also had to re because I was level two. So I had to go through level two re interview <laughs> There was actually a fairly long period when, no matter what level you were, or at least level threes, and so level twos, you had to take an exam every year, every two years, in order to maintain your certification. Like an actual full exam, like take the exam. Uh, All right, uh, next question. So, and how long over present? Is there any or anything anything more previous uh, to uh, the old drawing extra cards game laws? And uh, how like was, it, was that just always what it was previously before we had AC? Was there anything previous to drawing extra cards game laws? It was like, uh, and was yeah, the like. That we take away the topic. Did nobody ever you know, previously have any idea like how we get rid of this? And we well, as Sean kind of mentioned, uh, at the very beginning of, um, of the program, the policy, the, the, the philosophical view on policy is very different from what it is now. And we were much harsher with penalties. So something that we, like, we look back now and think, hey, how ridiculous is it to you know, disqualify someone for an illegal deck list? I mean, compared to that, getting someone a game loss for drawing extra cards is pretty tame. So even like, the idea that that would be more harsh than necessary didn't come about until maybe you know, five or six years ago. And so, something else that I should mention along those lines that a lot of people may not realize. We used to have five. 
level of the rule enforcement. Right? We, we got basically two right now, right? Um, I mean, professionals are kind of a third one. <coughs> It's not, still not all that much different from competitive brawl, but the penalties are still the same, right? But we said five, and the penalties were still very different. So drawing, or drawing an extra card might have been a game loss at what, one and two. And I'd have to go back and recheck my old IPG, but uh, it might have been a match loss. If, like, did you get, we got single, double, triple warnings, and then uh, I think a, tri a triple warning, you get the match loss, basically. I think a triple warning was a game loss. It depend, again, it depended on it depended on what level yeah, because it's, yeah. well, the enforcement was just totally different. Um, yeah. So, uh, for the most part, I would say that really, uh, as as so, they had, that um, it, it had pretty much always been a game loss, and it wasn't even until. And one of the things is when we started moving in HCU, there was a lot of debate about okay, how are we going to fix certain things and certain things. Didn't, we didn't know where exactly to place them. You've seen a lot of change for that. The reason I think that has taken so long is that for years we never had to think about that. The, 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 the fix was so far over this line, you didn't have to fix those situations. If this happened, the game's over. You don't have to worry about trying to back it up or how do you deal with the card that was drawn. It's, the game's over. You don't have to worry about it. Once you sort of, I guess, sort of opened up the, uh, the concept of, well, we don't have to do that. We actually can let people keep playing Magic. Um, I think that's a, a actually a really uh, powerful thing, place where we're at. But I think it, it it took us so long because of where we started. We started at this point where everything was so draconian uh, and and at this very harsh level. And as as we, it, I mean, pretty much, there's very few things if you look back, you know, from 10 years ago or even 20 years ago that we're more harsh about, if anything I can think about, than we were then. It's only gotten easier because we found ways of making. Having judges use their judgment, find ways for letting people keep playing magic, and allow that without having to just be handing out penalties left and right. The one thing that I would say we're, we're more strict on now is exporting content. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's for the best. Yeah. We want people that can be able to feel comfortable coming in and playing. Right. If we don't have people to play, don't want to come in and play with us, we don't have people to play. play, with us. We don't have to play with us. I think that's how we're looking. All right, our next one. Can I get a quick explain, like, I'm five from Swinger and or the other panelists on batches? We <laughs> <laughs> would like batches Explain to Sam as if he was five. Yeah. So my personal philosophy on rules changes is that I actually I try to remove the really old rule systems from my head as much as I can because knowing anything about fifth edition rules is unnecessary and confusing. Um, and I, I don't want to get mixed up with crazy things like batches, uh, which is what we have before the stack. Um, so I don't even actually, I don't remember the specifics of how they work. I don't really like it that way. So, so I'll tell you, here, here's my answer. So I started judging uh, literally about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, last month. Okay. I just looked at my watch, make sure I didn't know what year it was. What year is it now? 2019? Yes. Okay. Perfect. I know that it's been 20 years. Uh, and that was all under 6th edition rules. I never was a judge under pre 6 edition. I might actually be the youngest of the three, technically, if you talk about judging-wise. Uh, and therefore, I literally have no idea how batches work. And you're like, but Sean, didn't you play for like five years before that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because you, you didn't have to. You, you, you knew things like things were faster than the other. Interrupts were faster than instants, or instants were faster. They, the timing and how batches work, things like that was for the, the people that cared about rules that were on the the, the subreddits of the time. We called them Usenets, and, you know. Um, the, and so you didn't have to. You just, you just played and you said, okay, I want to respond to this. And you're like, okay, we can't respond to that because uh, it's a counter. We can only respond to the counter spell. It's another counter spell, uh, but you can't do it. It's the idea of why you're allowed to. You were allowed to wait for your opponents to decide not to counter spell your Armageddon, and after they chose not to, you could sack all of your lands to Zuranor. Because, what? <laughs> <laughs> because that was the, the counter spelling was part of the interrupt batch. And therefore, it would let that all resolve, and then you had the opportunity to do things, and you could not now counterspell the spell because the interrupt window had closed. <laughs> that helps it all. It probably doesn't, but, but it tells you why you probably don't want to know. <laughs> if you were king for a day, is there a rule you would like to enforce or change? I got one. I got, I got one. I'll go first. Oh, okay. uh, drawing a card is the first thing that happens in a turn. 
The game is the game is much more complicated, and as judges have made it very difficult for people to get to do things before they draw a card for the turn. And if I had a chance to change the game, we would move all that stuff that happened after you draw your card. Huh. Hmm. Change a few cards how they work, but yeah, we'll figure right. it out. Well, I don't know if it's something that I would change necessarily, but I have noticed that um, new training card games and new card games that may come out, a lot of them just get rid of the idea of taking actions on your opponent's turn. And I think that it does add a lot of depth to magic, but it also makes it way more confusing. Uh, and I think maybe if they had. Um, had time to sort of um, had more access to sort of game design technology, back to match this design, they might have just either got rid of that entirely or simplified it very late. Uh, you know, they've made combat such a big part of the game now. I feel like the, the, the combat needs, needs something done to it. I don't have a, a brilliant idea on how to solve this, but between beginning of combat and end of combat steps and the player factors and uh, There's still uh, a lot yeah, of so steps in that whole process that happen, game, and uh, uh, it's so, it, like I say, it's such an integral part of the game that I feel like it's going to need some more to, to make that um, easier for the average player, right? When you play on, when you play on, on the device, you don't have to step through every so single piece of it. Uh, um, I, I think that, that I, I still answer enough questions about that on the floor of events that I think that needs to be some more. Thank you. What are your thoughts on if and how social media, if and if so how, social media has changed the game? I'll take a crack at it. Uh, All right, sure. This may be, it may, well, maybe, it may be expanded to maybe the internet in general, but maybe social media. Um, the judge program itself, I think, what we think of as the judge program, I don't think could exist without social media. Uh, when, I, when we started judging, uh, you, judging was a thing that happened on the weekend. You you would show up for a tournament. You'd see your judge friends that you saw at the tournament. You'd judge your event. You maybe would go to dinner afterwards. And you'd go home, and you were done judging for that week. You were you know, and then maybe the next week you'd have another event or you'd have something. Um, but there was not a judge community. There wasn't so the idea of the judge program. The idea that there are things outside of that that would uh, that were designed to help us grow and build and, and develop as people, not just as, as judges or as these entities that help run tournaments. Uh, and it allowed us to expand that from just being a local social network to a global program that allows you to see people, you know, contact people that you can learn from, uh, but also hang out with. Uh, and that I don't think that could exist without uh, the advent of social media. Uh, so you talked about how uh, our penalty philosophy has evolved to remove overly punitive penalties and kind of add better fixes for, for many of the penalties we give out. Do you think there are any holdovers from maybe an older era where we're giving, I mean, giving uh, a harsher penalty that we couldn't really need to right now? Well, a year ago, I would have said, yes, um, bribery and improper determining the winner. Uh, I think that change is actually really good um, because I I got really tired really quickly of disqualifying little kids for rolling dice. Um, but the vast majority of the penalties that are in policy now are just warnings, uh, which I think is a pretty reasonable, pretty appropriate level for most of those infractions. Um, and I think the things that are more severe, like especially the top end, like stalling and cheating, really still deserve to be disqualifications. Yeah. yeah, I have to agree with Stephen on this one. Like, I mean, the most strict thing short of disqualification is outside of system right now. And that's not always a match loss. And that's not even, but even that's not always a match loss, right? If you weren't actually actively seeking it, and if you're actively seeking it, then you've got a bigger problem anyway, right? So, um, I, oh, yeah. I think we're actually in a pretty good state. Uh, the one thing I, I would think is worth considering is we have escalation paths right now uh, for, for, for uh, game relations, options, two warnings and then a game loss, and for others it's warning game loss. What, are those the appropriate levels for where they should go up? Could we have it go three and then up? For, for uh, you know, Or maybe it depends on the type of event or the type of round. We reset things for multiple days because it's if it gets to that, it means we at least think it, if it goes over ten rounds, maybe it makes sense to reset. But maybe there are ways we can we can play around with those in order to make things more uh, more fair, so that 
uh, you know, my own honest mistakes happen over a course of a day um, or allow maybe more lee leeway for uh, the head judge. <coughs> All right, next question, please. Um, I've got two questions. The first one's really quick and related to the social media question. Um, it's because you were judging before the internet existed, essentially. Uh, and you judge weekend to weekend events. How did you get selected to do those events, the big ones as well? It's a really good question. If you were the right people, you were much more likely to get selected. Like if, uh, you know, if you'd been judging with the TO for a while, um, then that's, you know, keep staffing you. And if you were like, you know, some level one or maybe level two in an isolated place and didn't have any personal contact with the TO, uh, you're probably pretty much limited to your local store. Yeah, my, my, uh, I was really fortunate. I had a level three that was local to me in Houston. So I was able to work with my, with that PTO, like Steven said, but uh, like my first pro tour back in 2002, I sent an email. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, you know, something like a, a Grand Prix uh, was really, back then, the sort of the top end of a local or a couple of local TOs. You know, have like the Chicago TO and the Madison TO would team up and they would, ha they would host Grand Prix Madison. And most likely, all of those judges, they've been judging all those PTQs there, would be the sort of the main core of that. And they may bring, bring in some additional people, people that they would know, or maybe there'd be some sort of, you know, uh, way of getting some outside people. Um, but then you're like, well, how do you get into the, the PTQs? Um, you know, if I was judging PTQ, maybe I would have a couple judges that I would know, but I may have somebody that emailed me said, hey, I want to be a judge. I'd say, come on down to my PTQ. Come work, work for me. And I, this person would be, Sometimes sight unseen, literally, and I would have them on the floor and try to figure out if this person could be helpful at all. <laughs> sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. Um, and if they end up doing well, maybe I would test them for level one that day. And if they were good, maybe we'd try to bring them back for the hey, we have a pre release coming up. Hey, why don't you, why don't you come up for that? Um, but it was, you know, it was these local social networks, and maybe you get a little outside there. I may know my TO, may know the Detroit TO, and so they say, hey, he wants to come out to go judge Grand Prix Detroit. Can you find a spot for him? And a spot for him means I'll let him work and maybe he'll get something for it. And probably not enough to cover anywhere near costs. Uh, this is even people remember when foils went away, we remember before foils got there. So, <laughs> so uh, there were definitely a couple of times when I'd be like, you know, judging pre release and, and the TO was also the Grand Prix TO would say, hey, I have this Grand Prix coming up in a few months. You want to judge there? And I'm like, that was it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I know for Pro Tours, it was actually possible to volunteer. And I literally mean volunteer, like, you didn't get anything. You got judge holes of those around, but you didn't get anything else. The other one's just completely unrelated, but uh, ignoring um, penalties, is there any infraction that you really like from the Wild West, Dark Ages, that you would love to see back, like, failure to agree on reality or infraction wise? I don't think anyone actually liked failure to agree on reality. <laughs> it's I, funny. I, I joke about me. bringing that one back. Oh, but the I'm fact, like. because it means that I meant that I never had to do any work of helping figure out what was going on in the game. That, that, like, that was completely on the play. That infraction but, basically but, existed for the times when, like, as a judge, you just had no idea what to do. <laughs> <laughs> if I realize, if two, two players said, I think I think he's a 10, I think he's a 5, both people get penalties because you both don't agree on that. Well, in theory, one of them's right. <laughs> and, and really, and, it's, and, and the person who's really wrong is the judge who didn't bother to figure out who actually was right. So I tell people, I don't need to worry about third degree reality, I am reality, right? I, when, I get, when, I, when, I, when I get to the, when I get to the table, it's hey, you know, hey, it's true like that. And because if I go to the table, if, if you go to a judge call now and the two players say, hey, we disagree on what life total Frank is at. You investigate, you go to the end, and then you tell Frank what his life total is now. And whatever that number happens to be, is now Frank's life total. And some of it doesn't agree with what either player thought it was. I've had that situation where they've both been wrong. Um, but we don't give them a penalty because they can't seem to figure something out. That's that's our job. I mean, just the same regard when people say well, we've been getting more and more, you might say, lax about what penalties we give out. You're like, well, won't that encourage more cheating? Well, it may or may not, but it's, it's our job to catch the cheaters. We don't need to, like, bake in... If we kick out enough people, we'll, we'll catch them. We'll get the cheaters eventually through these other penalties. It's our job to catch them 
and therefore just give these other pen you know give normal penalties to the people who make mistakes and catch the actual cheaters. Uh, there was a time when the head judge was considered the final arbor of everything that happened in the tournament. Yeah. So any decisions they made like couldn't be challenged. They could ban cards or you know make rulings that just totally conflicted with the official policy, and there was nothing that anybody could do about that. My favorite one was uh, kind of the origin of part of our missed trigger policy, right? Because uh, braids come all minute. What happens if you miss the upkeep trigger for braids and forget to sacrifice something? Avery head judge had an opinion on this, and they would make their own decision and announce it starting the event. So if you didn't. If you didn't play your, your triggers right, you might just oh, your card, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next question, maybe. We touched on this with some of the other questions, but I'm curious what you saw the ecosystem of judging being like. So we talked about how we got onto events, and that judging was something done on the weekend. It feels like these days there's different ideas of different types of career judges or judges that work certain circuits. So I'm curious a little bit more what it was like before the current paradigm. It was certainly much more casual, much less organized. Of course, there are far fewer judges. Um, I was judging in the New York, New Jersey area for a long time, and I could probably count the number of like regular judges, and that includes level ones, uh, like maybe ten, for the whole metropolitan area. Uh, so it was. It was definitely not as much. I mean, there was there was a community. There was there was a small tight knit community, but it was very. It was not as as organized, not as as diverse, um, and there was much less emphasis on teaching each other and helping each other. It was more like you know, if there's an event going on, we'll meet up for a couple of days and run it, and we'll just go for our separate ways. So that, you know, I reiterate that. I mean, one thing I, 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 I joke with people who, who from, from back in that time is that we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, as far as running tournaments, I mean, a 600-person tournament would just, like, blow our mind that someone could even do such a thing. Um, we had n none of these concepts. You, you'll see, you'll, if, for those who have been around in the last few years of Grand Prix, you'll see something like the uh, like Turbo Town as an evolution. It's one of those things you see happen, and you're like, oh, that's a good idea. Why didn't we always do that, right? You know, or, or, or other things like that where we didn't know. We're just like, I don't know, we've heard you need eight people to run an event, so we're going to run all our events with eight people. So if you want to play a vintage side event, we're just going to try to run a, uh, put a, put a, a list on the, on the you know, on the a clipboard outside uh, in front of our scorekeeper stage, and if eight people decide they want to sign up, we'll, we'll run a draft or something like that. Um, but... Um, but there wasn't re there weren't resources per se. You know, we, some people would write judge articles. If you can even find old judge articles uh, on on the wizard site because they never take anything down from their website. <laughs> <laughs> there might still be a tournament report for me from Brandon Houston, 2002, somewhere up there. Yeah, but uh, it was a lot more segmented. It was, it was very much about uh, you actually you actually had. PTO someplace close that you work with, great. Okay. So I was in Event Horizon as judge. I worked with Event Horizon as a Steven had his PTO and well, I didn't know who Steven was. We were judging at the same time doing the same thing. But we might, have, might as well have been opposite sides of the world. Yeah. And nowadays, you know, people will meet from all over the world to judge the events. Things were much more isolated back then. Like we, we, we ran the Northeast Grand Prix, the one North, one GP of the year, the Northeast U.S. got, and a bunch of judges in the Northeast, and that was it. Um, and, and ideas for procedures in the event could come from anywhere. I actually remember very early, before I started judging, Wizards came out with this idea of a sealed deck tournament. One of the ways they, they sold it, they, they, they tried to convince people that this is a really exciting new format you should play in was, well, you're gonna open up your, your cards and see what you get, and other people are gonna do the same, and if you have some cards that you don't want, you can trade them to other people. Maybe they can give you some cards that are good in your deck, and you'll give them some cards that are good in their deck. 
Yeah, yeah. that was that was official. It was good. I, I, I played I played in an Ice Age Seal deck event. It was very good. I, I, I traded all my non-black cards to go for all their black cards. Played a mono black deck. It was pretty good. But that was a few years ago. Uh, and uh, but yeah, so I mean that's during the time where yeah, even something like a sealed deck or you know a, a draft. Um, you know those concepts are still being developed in those. You know, mid mid nineties, late nineties, um, and then tournament structures. You know, or well, um, the other thing is well, I think people may introduce it. Uh, the idea of judge shifts. You people know about judge shifts. You you mentioned you worked shifts this weekend. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, those weren't invented till. That's a much more recent invention. Um, and so, if an event happened to be you know um, ele eleven bad. rounds. Someone thought that eleven rounds for a Grand Prix Day One is a good idea. Yeah. You, you're probably working all eleven of those oh, yeah. rounds. Uh, um, and, and so you know the, the concepts of what what, the, what a large event meant and what it took to do that were still pretty foreign to a lot of people. When we first started running sealed deck MTQs, um, so we knew that we didn't want people to like create their own decks, so that would be bad. People could you know, bring cards in from outside. Uh, so we wanted to have all the pools registered, of course, but we couldn't let people register their own pools because then they bring cards in from outside. Uh, on the other hand, if they know that they're not getting to keep the cards they register, well then just, they'll just like, take out the good cards from them and put some bad cards so that they can get some extra value. So we wanted to find this balance between people getting their cards back and not or not getting the cards back and we wanted to keep it unpredictable so players didn't know exactly whether they would get that pool back or not. So the way it worked was we seed everyone, we have everyone register their pool, put their name on it, uh, write their name on the inside of the box. Then we collect all of them, all of them, <laughs> in a big, big box. box. <laughs> yep. Sometimes then, then, yep. then now we have to determine that, like 10% of the field or so is the, the people we want to receive their pools back. So there's less incentive for you know making these pools worse. So we pull out one pool at a time, call up the name. The person comes up to the stage, they collect their deck, they get back to their seat. We will repeat this for about you know 20, 30 people. Yeah, uh, for, uh, for 200 person event. 200 person event. 20, 20, 20 people get their, their, their pools back. Then we have to redistribute all the pools by hand to everyone else. To make sure that they don't get their pool. And, and hopefully we'll have the correct number of pools and not like, you know, suddenly be short pool or two. Uh, and if anyone gets their own deck back at that point, they have to call it a judge and say, hey, this is my pool. And then we'll have to exchange it with a different one. Um, yeah, that was a real efficient process. Uh, I know you all have been around uh, for a while. Uh, even in the time that I've been judging, there have been a lot of changes to the IPG and the rules. And I know I and a bunch of my friends have accidentally given a ruling from a year or two ago. Do you have any good stories about a time that you gave a ruling from a year or two ago? Several years ago, back when there were many le five levels of rules enforcement, and there were these things called Grand Prix trials, hopefully people have heard of at least those. Um, <laughs> I was head judging a PTQ, and as a side event, we were running a Grand Prix trial along the same run. And one of my local level twos was the head judge of that Grand Prix trial. And recently, we had just changed the uh, penalty for deck error um, at rules source level two from match loss down to just a game loss. We were trying to be nice to people now. Only a game loss. <laughs> um, and so we had just finished our PTQ, doing our giving out all of our match losses for people who had registered. 39 card deck list on their limited deck list, right? And we finished that a little while later. My new level two judge came up to me, I was asking some questions about their event, which started a little bit while later. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Aha, I can always forget this. I was thinking the Grand Prix trial, but I remember it's not. It was not a junior, it was called a Junior Super Series event. Oh, oh, <laughs> you remember yeah, what it was? Uh, for children that were 16 and under. Uh, 15, I forget. Anyway. Um, so hey, they were coming up, they were still new, and they were saying, hey, uh, I just want to make sure I'm okay with uh, giving out how do we deal with these, these deck list penalties. And I'm like, oh yeah, yep, everyone, all the deck list, 59 cards, match losses for everybody. So there's about 30 people in the event, and about a quarter of them uh, had misregistered their pools because they're kids. And that's what they do. 
So we hand all these out, and I don't think anything of it because in my mind, I'm still thinking of this, this the old philosophy ever, at all levels of math philosophy. And it wasn't until later when uh, one of the parents for one of the kids <laughs> came to pick him up who happened to be a judge and say, hey, my son got this match loss in uh, round one. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Which event was that? Oh, the Jesus? Oh, oh, yes, that was our head judge over here. <laughs> uh, yes, he uh, he uh, in incorrectly gave out all of these match losses. Uh, however, after consulting with maybe some of those who probably should have known better. Uh, so that was that's my story of giving the wrong penalty. I don't know if where exactly this is placed, but the story of Chris Bakula talks about the like the bad old days of cheating and i was wondering if y'all have some like examples of what because i i just oh, yes. hear the bad old days <laughs> and like mike long has like a, just a binder on his person at all times in his lap or something like that but so I, I, I have a mike long story this was from grand prix washington dc which was the very first north american gp uh, I was on the main event staff. I, w I was a level zero, because that was normal. Um, <laughs> I had not yet taken the, the exam. Uh, Mike Long made day two. And uh, day two played in a small room. Um, we had some judges watching. And he sat on the back of his chair. So not on the seat of his chair. He had his ass up back here on his feet on the seat. He, his explanation was that he had a bad back, so he couldn't sit in the chair. Uh, I'm, 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 I regret to say none of the uh, judges there realized how much bullshit this was. Um, what he was doing was he was using his elevation to look over the table at his opponent's hand. And none of us realized this. <laughs> but but I, I, some of it has to do with the, one of the things we mentioned. We didn't. I mean, we didn't have training on this. I mean, this is you know, we have to catch catch a cheater. How do you do that? Well, I guess you see somebody cheat. <laughs> you know, um, and, and so that's one of the reasons. Like I said, a lot of these penalties things were sort of baked in, and that we would be overly harsh with these situations because we weren't very good at catching people. Uh, and when you have a system that has really poor enforcement, it it breeds it breeds the opportunity for those that want to take advantage of it to take advantage of it. And, and uh, I don't think it was that there was like a ton of it, but it allowed those that were good at to sort of prosper. You had people that were able to sort of do it, you know, on a regular basis, habitually. So, so um, the, you know. the one that I always remember, uh, Sheldon Mennery, who was one of my mentors through things, uh, nicknamed the sheriff a while back, came in and he did a lot of things to clean up, right? And did anybody do mid-round deck checks this weekend? Anybody? A few, right? There, there, there was a Grand Prix many years ago that Sheldon introduced the notion of we're going to do mid-round deck checks. Mm -hmm. And it, they, because the cheaters had figured out, okay, the judges are doing deck checks at the beginning of the round. Oh, they didn't check me. I'm good. And they would come in and they would make whatever changes for, for, for after that point. Yeah. And then, oh, mid-round deck check. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean you're checking my deck? And you just DQ what? 12? Uh, well, well, like, I, I know. We, we, we had, had, had somewhere between. I don't we had like seven, seven. But it wasn't all for, for the. Well, no, that was, that was a different. That was when we invented trap deck. It was very much like a lightning bolt from the sky, right? Of yeah. like, oh my god, there's actually somebody who's taking cheating seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and, he, and he used to like to re reference of somebody didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've first encountered deck checks in Boston in 1998, and I'd never heard of this process before. The head judge basically came up to some of us and said, hey, we're going to teach you this new thing called deck checks, uh, and he explained how to do it, and I deck checked somebody who's playing a mono red deck, and they had about 20 creatures, 20 lands, and 20 burn spells. Um, all of their creatures were in sleeves of one size, all of their lands were in sleeves of a different size, all of their burn spells were in sleeves of yet another different size. Uh, and, and we disqualified this player, um, but th that's because the players also had no idea what a jack check was. So there's a lot of stuff, that, like a lot of stuff that seems really normal for us today that was actually pretty innovative at the time, and like the first time it was used, it would catch a bunch of people. All right, so uh, unfortunately we're out of time. I appreciate you uh, coming out for uh, this panel.